Thank you, John. Delighted to be here. I, uh, first person I saw coming in was Gail and Leo, so I feel right at home. Um, the Children's Foundation now is an independent foundation uh, that is about wellness and pathways to keeping young children and young adults and families on the right path to have successful, fulfilling lives. And the area that we're most involved in now has to do with mental health, uh, including this great conference and including a lot of other issues that uh, unfortunately sometimes leads to suicide. We are now able to say that we have 77 community-based partners in the state of Michigan. Uh, when we started, as John mentioned, uh, three years ago, we had four partners, <clears throat> and many of you in the audience are partners now, and I hope many of you in the future will be partners as well. And when I say partners, I primarily mean we work with you on supporting programs that help children, adolescents, young adults, and families. Uh, and this is a great example of a wonderful partnership that we have with Kevin Song uh, that started a couple years ago and just gets stronger and stronger. And then we also like to bring in other partners, uh, such as what John mentioned, um, the ability to have Detroit Public Television stream this because they're a partner as well. No Resolve is a partner and, and several other um, of the exhibitors are partners as well. So we're delighted to be here. It's an honor for me to, uh, to be able to tell you about the Children's Foundation and to introduce our first speaker. Uh, John Delavolpe uh, is director of polling at the Harvard Kennedy School's Institute of Politics and founder and CEO of Social Sphere. The Washington Post referred to John as one of the world's leading authorities on understanding global sentiment, opinion, and influence, especially among millennials. And, the, and in this age of digital and social media, John has advised heads of state, Fortune 100 CEOs, military generals, athletes, and entertainers on how to use public opinion to tell their story identify and empower key audiences. I could certainly use John's help. Uh, John appears regularly on MSNBC's Morning Joe with Stephanie Rule, and his insights on America's youth are found in major media outlets in the US and abroad, including The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. In 2008, John received an Eisenhower Fellowship for which he traveled extensively through China, Hong Kong, and Korea, including a supervised day in North Korea, which would be interesting to hear about, studying millennials and their use of social media, which concerns all of us. In 2018, John received the Arthur E. Hughes Award for Career Achievement from the University of San Diego, and in 2013, he was named a future legend of marketing by the Ad Club of Boston. A graduate of the University of San Diego, John currently serves as president of the New England Association of Eisenhower Fellowships, is a member of the Eisenhower Global Alumni Steering Committee, a member of the Ad Club of Boston Board of Directors, and a trustee of iCatholic Media. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce John Della Volpe. John. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, John, Gail, thank you so much uh, for welcome, welcoming me here. Um, it really is um, an honor and a privilege to, um, to spend some time with you and, and to Jennifer, who uh, I met uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago at a similar conference in Boston. Thank you again for including me in this, um, this opportunity. So what I want to do is to uh, first of all, ask the AV team to, uh, to uh, if you could, put up my, uh, the other presentation with my speaker notes. However, I want to introduce myself as a pollster, right? So I am not an educator. I am not a clinician. I'm a pollster. And when 
Uh, I spend time with people to introduce myself. I, especially kids, I say, it's kind of like a professional listener. When my kids were little, I now have three young kids, my, uh, older children myself, uh, a millennial and arguably two members of the Gen Z generation, 20, 23, 25 years old. When they were younger, I would tell them I was a professional listener, right? The different kinds of organizations, whether it's through my work at the Institute of Politics at Harvard or through my private practice, hire me, hire people like me uh, on a regular basis to travel around the country to host conversations with Americans about the things that they care about and how they make decisions, right? Professional listener, qualitative research, focus groups, larger town meetings. It's really kind of key to what we do. In addition to that, as a pollster, we will then take those hypotheses that we might develop through conversations with Americans and test them through surveys. So that's, um, that's, my, that's my job, that's what I've been doing. And after 20 years of essentially spending every single summer uh, traveling across America, including Michigan, I noticed that things began to change. Okay, in 2017, specifically on issues related to youth. And uh, what I was picking up, I started to share through conversations with stakeholders and kind of my business, which is within the college university sector or the media or the government. And uh, I began to kind of organically um, share my thoughts, uh, began to be introduced to folks at conferences. And I think I might be kind of onto something that you're probably seeing on the front lines as well. And those, that's the kind of perspective that I want to, I want to uh, share. Um, typically, uh, it, when we think about, when I think about anxiety and depression uh, and someone like me spend some time uh, you know, on Google or other things, as you know, there's essentially you know, five or six key reasons associated with this, right? Teenage sleep deprivation, hormones, uh, lives are not their own. We have one boss, teenagers have six, if you think about schools. This is a, a piece that was written in 2017 in the Washington Post, right? The dilemma of standing out while fitting in, the role of social media, the uncertain future of job security. These are all things that create anxiety. Um, in addition to that, we can dig deeper and find additional kind of warning signs, okay? Um, specifically to family, uh, like around the recession, right? Family financial problems or separation or divorced parents. There are plenty of, of signs that organizations like this one um, make public. You can look, uh, of course, at the 2017 cover, September cover of Atlantic Magazine, and folks are probably familiar with a study by Gene Twang about how smartphones, have smartphones destroyed a generation, okay? That's the literature essentially that I've seen as kind of as a, as a parent, as someone who thinks about younger people. But what, what, what I want to tell you about is uh, my journey that began in 2017 and how those lists, while incredibly important, might be missing a couple of different factors, okay? And essentially, this is, this is the Harvard, uh, uh, Harvard T-stop, the, the metro stop in Harvard Square. And essentially the way it works is at the end of every academic year, I leave, right? So I leave town and I spend time traveling across America. I've done it every single year for 20 years when my project started back in, uh, back in 2000. And I, and I leave typically with an open mind and come back really optimistic and refreshed because I hear conversations like this one. Okay, despite, uh, this is from, this is seven years ago, eight years ago in Memphis, Tennessee, a group of uh, young, in this case it was the African American males telling me about America and they said, it's a great place to live, it's a land of opportunity, even with the economy the way it is, there are still opportunities, it's just that you have to know where to pull those resources from to get what you want, knowledge is power, and it is. And what I found so, um, so inspirational back in those days is I found that it didn't matter if you were from Memphis, Tennessee, where my daughter now teaches high school, or from Boston or anywhere in between, that young people felt optimistic. They felt that there was opportunity. It might take a young person from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, you know, 10 steps to get where someone from Harvard College can get in one or two steps, but it was there um, if, uh, if you're willing to kind of work for it and find it. 
Okay. Um, a few years later, I was in Los Angeles, and um, and I remember again these conversations like they were yesterday. And a young boy said to me, "You can do whatever you want." I asked him about America, and he said, "You can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want to be. You can be who you really are. Maybe people look at you weird, but they won't really do anything." Okay. And that was what America was to him just a few years ago. Okay. And these are kind of. I pull these out because they're kind of very consistent themes that I've heard from city to city, okay? Um, so in 2017, things began to change, okay? Um, and I started uh, this particular journey uh, in Columbus and in Nashville, Tennessee, and I went to a bunch of other cities. And as a pollster, you know, you, you've heard questions like, is the country heading in the right direction or in the wrong direction? You know, um, uh, what's the biggest challenge facing America, those sorts of things. Before I talk about those, I typically say, what's it like to be a 15-year-old or 25-year-old? Before we talk about, you know, the particular issue that I might be focused on, I want to know what's like to be who you are in your community and what the biggest challenges are, okay? Um, so I would start with this, and then this particular question, the next question I would ask is, uh, what's the biggest challenge facing America? And this is essentially, I had 25 people, so imagine this like a classroom, okay? I, get, I take the table, I used to do focus groups um, with teenagers where we have a big table with four people on one side, four people on the other side, and me at the top. Instead, what we do is I actually put 25 people or 30 people in a circle, no tables, um, no, uh, no, uh, nothing else in the room, and I'll sit kind of somewhere in the middle, um, somewhere on the, uh, within the circle, and maybe walk up and down, okay? And I find that has uh, uh, more people in the room actually kind of creates more agency and more honesty in the conversation. And uh, I said, what are the biggest challenges facing America? And very, very quickly, this is directly from these transcripts, gun violence, school shootings, this is Columbus, Ohio, just a few years ago, sexual assault, drugs, racism, unchecked rise of hate speech in groups. This is before Charlottesville. Surging levels of disrespect and incivility, inequality, crippling debt associated with the simple pursuit of going to college, right? This is urgent, the, the, this is like, this is different for me. This isn't jobs, this isn't healthcare reform, this is urgent, it was sad, it was painful to hear, it was dark, it was something I've never heard before. And uh, kind of organically, I said, okay, uh, does anyone know anyone who's ever been shot? I don't think I knew anyone who was shot when I was growing up. And I grew up in a, in a working class city outside of Boston. And, you know, many people raised their hands. Um, sexual assault, almost everyone raised their hands. You know, suffering from opioids or mental health or anything, everyone raised their hands just about, especially in, uh, in Ohio, different concerns related to drugs and other parts of the country. And at that point, I realized that there's just this weight that younger people are, are carrying that I had not ever thought of uh, before. And again, my work at Harvard means that um, I work with a couple dozen students every single semester, been doing it for 20 years. Every semester, we collectively work to identify questions that they want to know of their fellow uh, uh, members of their generation. I conduct five or 6,000 interviews in English and Spanish and, and thousands of other interviews for other clients. So I'm as in touch um, with this generation as arguably anyone in a position like mine, but this is, this is new. This is new for me. Um, I then went to Atlanta and I said, let's forget about the country, but let's talk about your own community, okay? Um, are things going well, and they're on the wrong track? Why? What are the factors that would mean things are going well or not? Okay? And um, again, not looking for anything other than a gateway to a conversation about public policy, this is, uh, these are exact quotes of, of, of what I heard. Uh, at my school, the drug rates and the suicide rates have all increased greatly. Mental illness is increasing, and we're acting like it's not there, and just saying, figure it out on your own instead of dealing with it. A lot of people have mental problems, depression, it's common, but others have PTSD. This is from a 15 or 16 year old African American boy. Um, when that triggers, it turns into a whole different problem, it causes a lot of suicides. Kids aren't really expressing their feelings, kids and saying how they actually feel because they're worried about being judged and stuff, 
so they resort to other things. Again, I didn't, I didn't uh, recruit individuals who had some indication of anxiety or depression or challenges in any way. I recruited a random sample, essentially, of high school kids in Atlanta, just like in Columbus, just like in Nashville and these other places. And I can't escape it. The purpose of these focus groups, actually, was to talk about issues related to um, public policy around, around gun violence and those sorts of things um, for another foundation that we were working on. But it's just hitting me. Um, hitting me in the face and I'd say, okay, well, still remembering what I shared earlier about that conversation in Memphis back in 2012, I said, well, what unites us, right? Not long ago, um, it was opportunity. So I'd ask this question, what unites us? And does anyone know, what do you think unites young people today? Say it, what? Anxiety, yeah, fear, okay? And again, I said fear and I go around the room Okay, and literally, this is the order of what young people were telling me, the order, okay? Fear unites us, fear, and I said fear of what? Fear of death, people raising their hands. Fear of our rights being infringed upon, fear of the future for our kids, fear of our, for our family, fear for our health, I could, I could continue. And, and then next I would ask, um, what don't we understand? And this is probably the quote, um, that I refer to most often when I, uh, I give a talk like this. And people ask me, like, what do we need to know um, about young people in America today? And whether those people, um, as Larry said, whether they're in the media or, or folks who are interested in serving in politics, I said, you need to understand that um, the way, and I kind of rephrase this, the way in which we, as older Americans think, in the words of this young woman, about um, finances or taxes, whatever our day-to-day -day struggles are, okay? Um, the weight that we carry on those things, that's the way they feel about living and dying every single day, right? This, this was a, a young woman who um, was a student at Ohio State University, talking about walking into those classrooms, thinking about you know, where the exits are, and, and, and how to deal with that on a day-to-day on -day basis. So um, the same daily weight, in her words, on an adult shoulders over bills and taxes is what children feel about living or dying, okay? Um, then uh, another question I ask is if you, so these, are, these images are like publicly available, but they certainly kind of represent the, like, the look um, as I remember the individuals I was speaking with, okay? So, so this is a young, a young man from, from Atlanta, okay? Um, again, just recruited just because of he fit the general demographic pattern that we were looking for, um, which is a mix of the community. I'd say if you were, essentially, if you were president for the day, or if you could write a, a postcard to the president, this is what I think what I said, if you could write a postcard to the president of the United States asking him to do one thing, what would it be? Anything. Again, this was not a mental health focus, anything. And he said, um, most schools have a certified psychiatrist because a lot of counselors, they listen to so many problems on the daily. They see they're listening, but usually they're just not sympathetic or understanding to what you say. Put a psychiatrist in every single school or psychologist in America. That's his one wish. It wasn't create opportunities for jobs. You know, uh, you know, make you know, marijuana legal, what a lot of older people think young people want. It was, give me the help that I'm asking for, okay? Give me the help, and it's so brave, I think. Um, who am I? I'm just, they're having a good conversation about what life is like, and within a couple of minutes, I'm seeing these conversations. So this is happening in 2017, city after city after city after city. I begin to, I begin to search you know, within members of your community and, 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 and seeing what other research I could find to see if this is something that I'm picking up that is an outlier or if this is actually happening. And there's, as we know, a lot of evidence to suggest that, as, as John mentioned earlier, sadly, kind of, this is, this is we're onto something. That, um, and in particular, in particular, the cultural trends, this is according to the um, American Psychological Association, Okay. The cultural trends in the last decade have had a larger effect on mood disorders and suicide-related outcomes among younger people compared to, compared to older people. 
Okay? 12 to 17 year old, as I think John mentioned, um, reporting symptoms indicative of major depression increasing 52% over the last decade. Among those between 18 and 25 years old, it increases even greater. Severe psychological di uh, distress and suicide rose by 70%, but it's, it's most prevalent, this increasing numbers among younger people. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, that all of this is caused, obviously, by the state of our kind of public discourse and public affairs. What I am saying is that when I looked at my at the the the, uh, the places to have conversations, right, and the warning and uh, the kind of the warning signs, I don't think that the state of our kind of government politics, the future, is as represented as perhaps um, as perhaps it might or should be. Okay, so 2000. In uh, 2016, we had an election. This is really what I studied. The, the focus and the objective of, uh, of all of our work, spe specifically my work at the Institute of Politics at Harvard, is to encourage and empower young people to participate in politics, in public service. Like, that's the goal. And, and um, really, kind of we ask you know, dozens and dozens of questions to understand what this generation cares about so I can, I can then um, share that with folks who, who need to have a better relationship with younger people to encourage them to vote and participate in public service or politics in, in some way. And through that, uh, we found that the most significant predictor of whether or not someone um, votes or doesn't vote or participates or doesn't participate is the degree to which they think that politics can make a tangible difference in their lives, okay? Um, that we saw a 15 point shift before and after September 11th on that issue. We saw a 15 point shift before and after the 2016 election on that issue, right? So politics really matters. People can see the difference. If you're a Republican, you can see the difference in what the Republican administration is doing. If you're a Democrat, you can see the difference that this administration is having relative to what you would have liked, okay? But that wasn't always the case. It wasn't always the case in 96. It wasn't even the case in 2012, okay? So what we're seeing in this and a lot of other data is this heightened interest in politics, okay? Um, when I asked young people in a focus group recently what their first political memory was, um, people who were like in college, it's their parents fighting in 2008 um, with Obama's election. Their dads would say were upset, they wanted McCain, their moms were excited, and there was tension. Right? And that tension continued, that tension continued over the course of family dinners and Thanksgivings and those sorts of things. Okay? This is their first political memory right? um, among kind of the younger cohort, the high school and the, and the college kids. Um, so um, when we think about, think about that, think about, again, not to be partisan at all, but the look at the last six months, the first six months of the 2017 administration. Okay? You had, uh, you had, um, the National Security Advisor resigning. You had one president call another president a sick guy, talking about repealing and replacing Affordable Care Act, including mental health. You had Comey fired. You had a concern about the environment withdrawing from Paris in terms of the future. And you had a gunman targeting um, members of Congress, right? And when I was in Columbus just a few weeks after that, I talked about, um, I talked about what kind of connects us. And they, and they said, well, school shootings connect us and other shootings connect us. I said, there was a shooting just a couple of weeks ago in Congress. I don't feel like we're connected or united. Not like we were after the Challenger disaster, not like we were in these other moments. And they said, well, those are politicians, not people. Okay? She, she like, retracted that. She didn't mean that. Okay? But that's kind of the, where people are kind of are coming from, I think. Okay? That they're just, you know, um, have this huge, huge weight about making sense of all the craziness that is American politics today, right? And that's before Charlottesville, okay? Um, where members of their own generation um, took those uh, tortures and, um, and, and created um, all that discord. Uh, after Charlottesville, I asked the same questions. What do we think about America? Again, it's a bloody mess. Calm before storm. It's in disarray. You can imagine why I call this presentation the United States of Anxiety. It was right around this time, okay? Uh, things are going downhill. People are overly aggressive. They're divisive. They're closed-minded. We're drifting from our roots. These are 16 and 17, 18-year-old kids, okay? It's a messed up Rubik's Cube 
This is interesting, right? It's a messed up Rub Rubik's Cube. I feel like our country and the world isn't together. We're all off on different pages. By the way, I don't hear conversations related to like President Trump or this or Democrats. It's like not even associated with partisanship in some way. It's not about not liking this person or that person. It's the system. It's a system as, as a whole, okay? America is like a giant hole because you don't know where, what the bottom, you don't, you don't know what's in the bottom of a hole. The more actions you take, the more unknown the future is. I'm hearing this, okay, right after Charlottesville, okay? Um, so we spend so much time thinking about our cell phones. We spend so much time, and there's deep, deep concerns, and I'm sure we'll have conversations about this in terms of, you know, image and, you know, social media, et cetera. But one of the things associated with social media is that the average person, I think, is getting eight incoming messages around breaking news on their phones, okay? So it's just not what you're seeing on Snap or Instagram, but you're also getting breaking news about, uh, about uh, events that um, many people aren't uh, prepared to, uh, to think about, okay? Um, so I talked about, I talked about the uh, young woman from Ohio State who talked about living or dying. And this is a story of, of Isaiah. Isaiah is a young man I met in Culver City um, and there have been 25 or so kids sitting in a big circle. And uh, this little boy, he looks just like this little boy here. Um, he's he, he, he's in from, uh, from like, I think, South Central LA. And he, was, um, he just moved to this new school in Culver City, which is a nice suburb. And he goes, I'm a little bit shy. You know, I just want to say I may not talk that much, et cetera. I said, OK, well, so I'll sit next to you. You'll be, you'll be good. I asked a question about, has anyone ever had a tough conversation about politics? And Isaiah raises his hand. I said, OK. Uh, what do you have to say? And we had like football stars and cheerleaders and like all the cool kids in LA were in part of this group. And Isaiah is like undersized, he plays the drums. Um, his parents I think were jazz music musicians, quite a bit older than most of the parents in the school. And he talked about, yeah, I had a tough conversation because I was having lunch um, the other day at, at a table with some white kids and uh, my, my friend who, he, he, he's, he, he's got some challenges, he's got some issues he said. He's, uh, he was, he was uh, listening to his iPhone under a tree, and uh, the kid said, hey, look, uh, there's an ape a orangutan in his natural habitat, right? Uh, under a tree, African-American boy, white kid said that, at the table with Isaiah. And, uh, and then uh, he said, well, then he had the headphones on. He goes, yeah, it looks like a noose. And I said, I, I said Isaiah, what did you, what did you say? What did you do? He goes, well, I confronted him, right? So, Little Isaiah around a table of other kids. I said, well, what did you say? He says, that's very insensitive. He said, uh, it's racially insensitive. And he talked about his feelings. And, um, and uh, I said, well, what, then what happened? And he goes, well, they said, why are you making this about race? You know, and then they walked away, OK? But um, that's the difference, though, OK? I'm not sure if I was in that position 30 years ago, if I would have stood up you know, to that kid. Um, or if other generations would have, okay? And one of the things that makes me optimistic is that young people, again, from what I'm seeing, organically are identifying the issues that are challenging them, whether it's the PTSD or the stress or having more help. And they're also indicating that it's not okay to act like that, okay? And I don't think everyone's doing that, but I think there is, what I'm sensing is there's a sense of, um, of, uh, of agency among, among younger people, okay? Um, now, when we also look at the research, um, and we can see from a 2017 study from the New England Journal of Medicine, what I found, which many of you likely already know, that several recent studies have consistently found that living communities with high levels of racial prejudice is associated with an elevated risk of disease and death, right? So the state of our politics is making all of us kind of less healthy, especially younger people, especially other people at risk, okay? Um, there was a study just not long ago published. It did, it did not get nearly as much attention as I hope it will after this um, in the uh, Wall Street Journal. And they kind of made fun, I think, frankly, um, of that, you know, politics is making us lose sleep. Well, yes, it's making us lose sleep. 38% of Americans, which is a significant number, 38%, okay, indicate that politics is a source of stress for them. But in addition to that, okay, there is a, a tremendous amount of analysis. And the only age group that is predictive 
of, 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 um, of, of political stress making your physical and your mental health um, less well. The only demographic group is age. If you are younger, you are more affected by politics. And it makes you less physically well, emotionally well. You do behaviors that you regret and you have uh, uh, impacting your social and your, uh, and your lifestyle habits. The only other group um, of, of individuals in this study where there was a, a correlation was with people who don't have a job, people who are unemployed, okay? But gender doesn't matter, race doesn't matter, education doesn't matter, it's based upon young people, okay? So um, there continues to be other evidence, this has just happened, this was published two days ago, three days ago in The Economist which is not at all associated with, with some of the issues I'm talking about, but there's a linkage to higher minimum wages linking to lower rates of suicide. So the idea of public policy also affecting Americans in that, in that particular way, and there's also other correlations around, not surprisingly, gun violence prevention legislation as well, okay? All this is happening before Las Vegas, before Las Vegas, okay? And we think so much about Parkland, Las Vegas and Parkland together had a much larger effect. We've been tra we're tracking um, young people's um, opinions related to, to uh, guns and school shootings and violence of, um, you know, for 20 years. And surprisingly, public opinion did not change dramatically after even Newtown or Virginia Tech. Okay? It was after, after the Las Vegas shooting where this generation of young people started to transform how they thought about about this issue. So these things are getting real. Um, we went into the field that, um, that fall with a survey. I tested some of these theories I heard the previous summer. Two thirds of young Americans tell me they have more fear than hope about the future of America, right? So there's 75 million younger people roughly between 18 and 35 years old. And two thirds of them have more fear than hope. That's, a, what's that, 50 million, okay? Tens of millions of Americans have more fear than hope about our future. Okay. Four out of five Americans are concerned about the state of race relations in the USA. Four out of five. These are, these are surveys of uh, you know, 3,000 individuals. And this is again before Parkland. And Parkland, um, Parkland is, is, um, is important for so many reasons. That's at the point where all of this anxiety that had been you know, kind of bubbling up, and not just since 2017, clearly it's been happening you know, for years before that. But that is when younger people challenge other younger people and empower them, right? Um, when I um, watched the first interview of, uh, of, of David Hogg, who was, ran the school newspaper and the media, you know, at his high school, he, took his, he rode his bike, because you couldn't get there with a car, rode his bike over to the, to the scene of the murders, and he was interviewed uh, by Laura Ingram, and her, she said, do you have anything to say? He goes, yes, you need to vote. If you want to change this, he empowered people. You need to do something. You need to become active, and you need to vote, okay? And from that moment, these young people empowered other young people. We all know the famous speech now by Emma Gonzalez. This was a part of her AP, I think, civics uh, paper that she was working on. Um, but she transformed it into the speech where she called BS, including um, to people whose kids don't know, I just wanna read this, she goes that uh, us kids don't know what we're talking about, that we're too young to understand how the government works, we call BS. And immediately after that, in Florida and around the country, we saw spikes of young voter registration um, and, um, and really kind of taking all this anger and angst and trauma and anxiety in moving it towards something that was going to be productive, okay? So again, we go back into the field with another survey um, uh, for, um, for another client. We found that 77% of young people under four, between 14 and 30 tell us that they or someone close to them have been affected by mental health issues, 77%. Okay, 59% affected by racism, 55% sexual assault, and this is men and women, much higher, of course, if we just focus on young women, right? 31% by opioids, 26% by gun violence, 44% if you're black, and well over that if you're black and you're male, 
Okay? So these are the weights that they're carrying. And uh, it's not uh, you know, inconceivable at all to hear in a focus group or someone I meet who talks about a best friend, obviously, who has committed suicide or is on life support for an overdose or something like that. Okay? Um, and 54% tell us, okay, when we talk about the future, that uh, mental health is a very important subject, very important in terms of uh, the future of America, in terms of mental health funding um, related to, to the na our national priorities. Okay? I think it was four or five on a list. It was higher than climate change. It was higher than income inequality. It was higher than a dozen other issues. It only trailed school shootings, which is number one, access to higher ed, health care, and jobs. That's it. Everything, every single other issue was below that. Okay? And for me to get that list, I didn't come up with this list my own. I talked to young people. We collectively just, uh, developed that list and tested it. So 54% tell us that mental health funding is very important when they think about the future of America. Okay? Um, other quick things, Generation Z is stressed, depressed, and exam obsessed. Again, uh, The Economist, and I share this with you because, again, it has important aspects about bullying and anxiety and drug addiction, but not about the state of our politics. And here's something, too, that's incredibly important, is this generation is different. And uh, I spent a lot of time comparing this generation with their parents, Gen, uh, Z, Gen X and baby boomers, and this is different that when we ask, or when authors of a study, um, stress study ask um, how they feel about their, ex about their mental health, 70% of baby boomers say they feel great, excellent or very good, less than half of, of, uh, of this generation feel the same. Okay? I'm doing this to check to see if what I'm seeing, like kind of in the streets and in these communities is, is kind of connected to real quanti quantifiable science, and it is. Okay? But here's the good news. Okay? The good news is, in my opinion, okay, that young people are doing something about it. Okay? And regardless if you're a young conservative or a young liberal, everyone voted at record rates in 2018. Okay? So the things that we saw were happening after Parkland, which was the number one predictor of whether one someone showed up. Okay? They care about school shootings, and the more anxious, the more stressed you were, the more likely you were to come out and vote. Okay? So they're using this this angst and they're turning it into something positive. You can see there's a spike over the, over the last 32 years, on average, only about 17% of young people would participate, okay? So when baby boomers, who like to complain about young people being lazy and narcissistic, when they had the opportunity, only about 17% showed up to vote. When my generation, Gen X, had the opportunity, about 17%, okay? When millennials had the opportunity, 20, 21%, but when Gen Z, kind of your students, um, and the folks that you spent a lot of time with when they had the opportunity, not great numbers, but twice as much as at any time in the last 32 years, it was 32% uh, conservatively, conservatively, okay? And, um, and we're seeing similar um, uh, uh, interest, of course, in the 2020 campaign. So um, back at Harvard, I conducted another poll just a few months ago, less than a year ago, and we had a, a series of emotions. We said, um, you know, have you, which of these have you experienced in the last 24 hours? And we found that as many 18 to 29 year olds in America experienced uh, joy as anxiety. Okay, so half of young people in the previous 12, uh, 24 hours experienced anxiety. Okay, in addition to that, what we found was that there was a connection to views related to the direction of our country. If you thought the country was headed in the right direction, you were less anxious. If you're concerned about the craziness in Washington and the world, you are much more likely, significantly more likely, to be anxious, okay? There was no difference based upon joy, okay? If you thought the country was in the right direction, if you thought it was the wrong direction, still between 52 and 48 percent experienced joy. Okay. What I really hope, one of the outcomes from talks like this are, is to, for us to communicate more effectively to baby boomers. And whether these are the parents or grandparents of this generation, this has to happen. This is a conversation that I had in Pittsburgh, um, I guess a year and a half ago. And the um, guy's name was Dennis. He was a basketball referee in his, in his spare time. He worked in a technology company the rest of the time. And I'm having that same conversation I had with the younger people. I say, what's the biggest issue in America? And I'm going around the room, you know, and I'd hear uh, immigration, economy, healthcare, and, uh, and Dennis, 
If you've got any football fans in here, he was like a Bill Parcells kind of guy, right? He was very direct and very, very direct and uh, made my job easy. And I said, are you optimistic? He goes, I don't think it will get any better in five or 10 years in terms of America because all the older respectful folks are dying off. And then it's just gonna be the, 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 and I said, what, the millennials? He goes, yeah, the young ones. The conservatives are dying off. The people that had respect actually fought in a war and planted a flag somewhere, okay? All that is wrong. Okay, yes, he's right that young, older people are more conservative and they're dying and they're being replaced by people who have a different, you know, views of politics, okay? But don't for a second believe that this generation hasn't fought in wars, right? Don't for a second believe that this generation doesn't um, respect the flag, um, that um, they don't, I think, many members of this generation fail to really kind of listen and understand how the world is changing, right? And it's really important that we kind of break down these stereotypes and, uh, and, these, and these barriers, especially around just blaming everything on the phone, blaming everything on the phone, right? There's been a lot of research that indicates that the phone screen time is bad. It's linked to all these negative behaviors. There's a very, very important study, uh, again, just released within the last, what, week? January 17th, Washington Post, okay? Um, I wanna read that uh, third paragraph. Okay, what this was research out of Stanford, which is essentially kind of um, said we got to look more effectively at the phone. There are other things associated with the phone, among likely the things that I'm talking about, which is the incoming information about politics. Why else might Americans be anxious other than their telephones, American kids? How about climate change? How about income inequality? How about student debt? There's so many big structural issues that have a huge impact on us, but are invisible and we're not looking at. All right, so just extend this conversation that you're having into that space. So what do they really want? Okay, we know what stresses them out. What do they really want? I spent a lot of time asking people this. And, um, and I think it's pretty simple, okay? So this is someone, Childish Gambino, who's an actor, he's a, he's a hip hop artist, variety of things. And he writes in one of his songs, his lyrics, being happy is the goal, greatness is my vision. Okay, that I think really speaks to younger people today. Being happy and being great every single day in small and important ways, okay? When I conduct a survey, I said, what is the, uh, you know, asking a couple thousand young people, I said, what's it like to be happy? What's your version of the American dream? What do you look forward to? And these are just some examples, okay, of the future, okay? A happy family, a well-paid job, small garden with a house, that's everything, okay? I wanna be happy, I wanna be well-fed with a roof over my head, with family and friends who love me. Again, these are indicative of thousands of, of, of interviews that I have, okay? They're not asking for you know, fame. They're not asking for millions of dollars. They're asking to be happy, okay? When um, I conducted another survey, we released it on Real Clear Politics on the future of education. I had 20, 20, almost 20 different variables around the job of, of, uh, of our public education system. One would be happy. Okay, 67% said be happy was a very important part of what our education system was, should do. 27% gave um, uh, an excellent or a good, good, good grade to our performance. There are more people who are interested in the public education system making our kids happy and well adjusted than even going to college. Okay, so you can find that online, Real Clear Opinion Research Education page. Okay. Um, being ha healthy emotionally and physically, not have a ton of stressors, have a job you're happy with. Imagine like a 17, 18 year old talking about stressors, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, in a focus group uh, back in this fall, uh, I said, has anyone, anyone have anything to share about their life? What's going in the right direction? What's it like? These are, these are 25 year olds. And uh, this young woman sitting over here to my right hand side, she says, I can afford a therapist now. I can do things in my free time. That's a big, big, you know, kind of shift for me, okay? Her American dream is being able to have enough money so she doesn't have to share an apartment with eight people from the internet she's never met before and, and see a therapist. That's her American dream, okay? Um, so I'm gonna close with this and then hopefully, um, I don't have a timer up here, so hopefully I'm okay with time and we can um, have a little bit of a, of a conversation discussion. But again, when I talk um, to, um, to try to uh, let others know um, 
what they need to know to kind of understand this emerging generation, I say there's like just four things, okay? Um, first of which is understand two-thirds have more fear than hope about the future, part one, right? Part two is they have little faith of our institutions to change anything, okay? Um, little faith in institutions that have been going down for all Americans, but specifically um, younger Americans. The third is the concerns uh, about mental health. Um, we can see the number of people affected, the number of people who believe it's a national priority. Um, and they want to be empowered, right? They need to be better understood. There are millions and millions and millions of young people essentially raising their hands um, to their parents and their grandparents and the educators and all of us to say, recognize me, let me have this conversation, let me help, help me figure this stuff out. And um, obviously too many of them are being ignored. So when I think about these, these topics in a political context, I'd say we can't have a conversation about like a particular policy until there's a relationship of trust, right? Until you can empathize and understand what it's like to kind of be in their shoes. And until you can, you need to do that first. And then once you establish that trust, then we can have, in a political sense, conversations about like what the right policy is or what the right next steps are, et cetera. Um, and I think that's the same thing, potentially the way in which I think about it. I can have a conversation about, you know, gun violence or future of education or these other things until I understand where these issues fit into the day-to-day -day life of that, uh, of that you know, teenager. I'm not saying that all the other issues that we talked about at the beginning um, around body image and social media, I'm not saying bullying, I'm not saying any of those things are less important. What I'm saying is let's also include the state of affairs in our world and appreciate that that's just one additional stressor that um, young people are sharing with us. So with that, um, hopefully we've got some time for some we got 10 minutes for questions. Perfect. So, uh, Alan, thank you. Hello. Hi. So, I just have a question. I work with young people for the last 20 years. And what I find is to say, like, the word happy, I want to be happy, or I feel anxious, how do you define those words? in the context of your conversation. Because I find that a lot of young people have really unrealistic expectations of what being happy actually looks like. And also, ang the word anxiety. You know, if you worry about something a little bit, it's different than having so much worry that it interferes with your activities of daily living. Right. So how do you define those things? So good question. So I, I, don't, I don't think uh, the... The young people I'm interviewing and surveying, they're not using anxious and happy, right? That's what I'm doing to put a theme on top of um, fear of death, fear of not having enough money for college, you know, fear, by the way, right, if you're in a city, um, uh, I spent some time in, in Brooklyn, you know, with eighth graders um, whose parents don't go to to uh, ever go to any school activities for fear of being deported, right? Um, as just one other example, I could go on and on, right? So I'm, I'm applying the term anxious to those feelings that I'm hearing about their future, right? So, um, so that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. I, don't, I, I think in college, people say I'm stressed. I say, why are you stressed? Because of, the, because of the exam or because of this or because of that. But I'm just using the things that they care about the things that they're concerned about to put within that general category of anxiety. And same thing with happy. I'm telling you, so, so I've done a lot of work, a lot of work on what the goals are of peop young people's goals are, okay, uh, for many, many years. One of uh, the, the subjects I spent a lot of time on is I, I help with the, um, help the United States Marine Corps think about how to recruit another generation that's representative of America. In order to do that, we need to understand kind of what their goals and objectives are in the next phase of their lives, right, from, from late teens to 20s. And number one, okay, there's a long list, right, of like be famous, make money, have experiences. The number one thing, and it continues to be the case for a decade, is to do something my parents would be proud of me, proud of, okay? Um, giving back, right? So 10 years ago when people would ask me, 
what is it about young people? You know, I said, um, they, they don't vote that much, right? But almost everyone is giving back, serving the community in some significant way. Right? They just want to be, that's why I say greatness, right? They want to be good people. They want to serve their community and do those sorts of things. Those are the kinds of things I would say would make them happy, feeling some value in the experience that they're helping somebody else. Um, and and, and those, those other things about having a house, a garden, someone who loves me, those I would argue are incredibly important, but perhaps more modest goals than someone like me might have thought when I think about my generation, which is, you know, Fame, fortune, well, you know, like when it's grown up in the 80s, right? So I think that um, I think the recession has had a incredibly significant impact on this generation in terms of how they define happiness, the American dream, those sorts of things. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm the father of a 17 year old son who took his life a couple of years ago. Um, and I read the book by Jean Twinge where she finds, I read the book by Jean Twinge. Yes. So I'm the father of a 17 year old boy who took his life two years ago. Um, and I read the book by Jean Twinge where she finds correlations between smartphone use and a lot of negative things. Right. Uh, so, and I've since heard a lot of people challenge that, that there's all these other things going on. But I guess the one thing I would say is when you look at all these four major stressors, I, I can't help but think that all these are very much um, brought, uh, made, made uh, uh, hyper aware in the minds of every kid who's got one of these things that, that uh, you know, the hyper connectivity we have today has, you know, these things exist for sure. Yes. And, and they aren't themselves a product of phones, but the fact that every kid is so aware, <clears throat> excuse me, of what's going on is. So I'm curious what your thoughts might be on that. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think that the criticism around, I think I generation, is that the book, I Generation by, by Twang, Gene, um, is that it's just more complex with, sc all screen time isn't the same, right? And that, um, the content and the context of what's coming um, through that screen is um, likely in a more important part of, uh, of the conversation to understand than just the screen time alone. So yes, it's, uh, I hear, I'm not an expert in this particular subject, right? Uh, but I hear a lot from younger people who tell me that's a stressor um, and it depends upon a young girl who tell me about having the pressure to look and feel a particular way, right? Or the bullying, you can never get away from the bully like you could, you know, a generation ago without the phone, right? So we hear a lot of examples about the negative behavior, not able to escape from it because of that cell phone. And I think that the, just the criticism is not that the cell phone isn't on, isn't, the cell phone necessarily isn't unhealthy because it's a cell phone or smartphone. It's, it's allowing these other opportunities and for people not to be able to escape them. And one of the things that I want to say is if you're the 40% of Americans who stress out by politics, you're younger, it's going to be even higher than that. And let's also put that into the right framework and let's have conversations about the public space as well as all the other important issues that young people are, are currently kind of dealing with. I remember another little, little, little thing about, um, about uh, from a, a teenage boy, he goes, I just, I wish like life was simple the way it was when I was like in eighth grade, right? When he didn't have a smartphone or cell phone. He knew who his buddies were, he played after school, right? And life was simple. I can you imagine someone saying life was simple in eighth grade, right? Um, but he didn't have like the technology. It's only three or four years. He was only like in high school. Um, so I just think there's more nuance and context to the smartphone than, um, than some people might fully appreciate, especially people outside of this room who apply their own standards from what life was like when they were growing up in the 70s or 80s. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, my name is Lawrence Gilliam. I go to a U of D Jesuit. Um, I wanted to ask you if you think there's a strong disconnect between uh, Gen Z and adults of today. Uh, <laughs> yes, huge. It's not, I mean, I laugh because it's, it's so large. So, um, so I did a survey um, 
without offending any baby boomers in this room, uh, I did a survey and I said, uh, what, uh, overall, uh, I did all Americans, overall, like, uh, do you think your generation, given, you know, how old, given the amount of opportunity that the Gen Z generation has had, millennials, Xers, boomers, and the final generation, given that, put that into context, do you have a favorable or unfavorable opinion of, this of these different generations, okay? okay? Eight out of 10 ba uh, baby boomers have a favorable impression of their generation. They look back, the, their life lasts several decades, they say, yeah, we've done a really good job managing the country, managing things in America. I could dispute that. Um, and when, they, when we asked the same question about millennials, three out of 10 said they had a favorable impression of millennials. Two out of 10 had a favorable impression of, of Gen Z. Okay? So, so many people talk about, including Gene Twang, talk about younger people being narcissistic. Okay? It's, I don't think it's narcissistic to take a selfie, to share it with a parent or a friend, um, because it's, it's the way in which your generation kind of communicates. I've learned so much from my kids, what they, you know, including me on their Snapchats and Instagram, because that's the way in which they communicate. That's not being narcissistic, I don't think. Okay? Narcissism is when you have an overinflated view of yourself of which the baby boomers clearly do, right? So there's that, that's just clear, right? So there's that, there's that gap, okay? And also, also, um, also, um, there is a huge gap in the value set. Huge gap, okay? If you're over, so the biggest divide in America today isn't race, isn't education, it's generation, okay? Two-thirds of people over 50 vote one way. Two-thirds of people under 50 vote another way. Okay, so there is this incredibly large generation gap. Now, whether that gap turns into a crisis or a war, we don't know, okay? But um, the, it's an incredibly uh, important insight and uh, a topic I think it's really worth thinking about um, as we think about the future. One more, Jen. Great. Can you hear me? I oh, can okay. Hear you. Uh, good morning. I Hi. wanted to bring up a couple of things because I think this affects all people. If we do not have a balance in our life of physical, mental, and spiritual, and the way we are lucky in America that we can worship as we believe, but I think, if I understand it correctly, that a lot of people are never taught any religion. And that might be part of the reason why there's so much crime. They've never learned that they're, and, and they kind of have that hole inside themselves if they don't have any spiritual belief. But also I wanted to ask about um, the myelinization process. I had an anatomy and physiology class that said that until uh, everyone finishes the myelinization process with the brain in, in the spinal column, um, that they're not capable of higher thought. And wouldn't that apply to some of our young people who make these decisions before they're really capable of some of our higher thinking? Uh, thank you. So I, um, I think a couple of points. Clearly that um, younger people today there's a growing number of people who classify themselves as none in terms of no specific religious preference. However, um, I still find in surveys that uh, 60 plus percent say that religion is important to them, right? So they're not practicing it the way that older generations have, but there's still some sense that it is important, one. But the point about, again, I have no training in psychology at all. However, I've read about some of these things, okay, and what I've learned is that the average young person isn't fully mature until they're 25 years old, okay? Well, just think about what life has been like for the last 20 years for that, okay? From 9-11, from okay, to a war for weapons we're still looking for, to Katrina, to a Great Recession, to school shootings, okay? So these incredibly traumatic events are different in more near and more close than they were for any other generation 
And this is what's happening as that brain is sort of developing, right? Um, and uh, they're still trying to work their way through it. And I don't think, at least from the narrow place I look at, that's certainly kind of our civics education, right? And I don't know about the role of religion and public schools and those sorts of things, but certainly having that kind of grounding and making sense of all the kind of real-time news is uh, as, as much of a challenge as it's ever been when the stakes have never been higher. So another thing adding to the stress and anxiety. So I think that's my time. Thank you so, so much. Um. <laughs>